Yeah, we're filming this. You made your own. All right. Okay, cool. So uh, this is very intimate. Like, uh, that's who I am, Seth Lake. Uh, my business is VSL Aviation. You got the FAA moniker on here because I'm an FAA uh, designated pilot examiner, and that's kind of the whole. Uh, point of this presentation is to talk you through the process of getting your ATP and with that comes the military competency stuff So we're going to talk about kind of everything and then some additional ratings and stuff I can offer you um, with, with my business, so All right overview. We're just going to cover the airline transport pilot the CFI uh, Certification your UAS certification then we'll talk about the wings fast program uh, Which is another resource that's out there for you? All right, eligibility, uh, all the words up there, you need that. Um, basic gist, you need uh, basically everybody in, in here right now would be eligible for military competency and probably, since most of you have over 750 hours, at least a restricted ATP. If you have over 1,500 hours, we'll go into detail on those. Uh, you'll be eligible for the full up unrestricted ATP. But the rest of, is on there. We're gonna go by piece by piece on how to get all of these. Uh, Show of hands who has their ATP already. Okay, sweet. So this might be useful for some of y'all. Uh, ATP hour requirements. This is uh, outlined in 61159. Uh, these slides will be available. They're all hyperlinked, so you can download them, click on them, and it takes you to the FARs. It's good to know the, the source, and they do change from time to time. But basically, ATP hour requirements, the 1,500 hours are the big one. Uh, you've got the 500 hours cross-country time. That is outlined in the FARs of what counts as cross-country real world when you come to me for your check ride we're probably going to take a percentage of your total time and just assume that you know 80 percent of the time in the c-130 you were doing some sort of cross-country work because we don't log cross-country time in your air force logbook right you don't keep track of that so uh, it is a factor of percentage and just kind of a discussion in that you have with your dpe about yeah this i've got these hours and most of y'all are going to have well over um you know, 1,500 hours, um, probably up, you know, over 2,000 hours total time. And most of that is going to count as cross country. Um, 100 hours of night time, uh, 50 hours in a class, so that's multi engine airplane. Uh, maximum of 25 hours in the simulator, so if you are a Minturn person that's going for that restricted, you can count 25 hours of the, uh, the simulator. However, the C-130J doesn't count as a simulator. It doesn't fall into the categories of a 141 or 142 operation, uh, so really it doesn't count for anything. So you're, you're going to be relying on your hours. Fortunately, though, because we can get the restricted at 750, you're not really going to need that simulator time as a military pilot. I haven't run across that yet. Uh, the 250 hours of PIC in airplanes, so you'll you'll need that. Um, and then the 75 hours of instrument flight uh, kind of goes into detail. A lot of words up there, but that's the basic gist. 99% uh, of C-130J guys at the FTU are going to meet all these requirements. The ATP restricted, uh, you just need the 750 hours of total time and be a graduate from UPT. Uh, not necessarily Air Force UPT, it could be any military undergraduate pilot training uh, course, 750 hours, and then when you meet the requirements that are outlined here in 159, I can administratively remove that restriction and you'll have a full up ATP. There's no additional check ride you have to do. So what that means is at 750 hours, you can complete all the requirements that we're gonna go over here, get your ATP done, and then at 1500 hours, while you're still in the military or whatever, you can uh, come back to me and for a small fee, I'll re just remove that restriction and you'll be a full up ATP pilot with, without an additional check rate. So that's, that's a way that you can work ahead in your career. Not necessarily people in this room, uh, but if you're watching the video later, um, if, you're, if you're in like the 41st as a co-pilot, you could, you could probably right around the time you upgrade to AC, get your ATP done. And then while you're sitting on your commitment for the last three or four years, just be building time. And when you hit that 1500, you're good to go. All right, the ATP process, uh, basic process, graduate UPT, done. Um, pass the military competency exam. So the mil comp, uh, I think everybody in this room said they have some sort of mil comp done. A lot of the UPT bases have a DPE near them, like me, that'll do your mil comp. 
So you'll graduate UPT and immediately upon graduation you'll be eligible for uh, airplane single engine, airplane multi-engine um, commercial and instrument rating. And that's, you have to go to a testing center, you take a military competency exam, and you take that exam results with your graduation certificate to a DPE, and you become a FAA certified pilot, you know, commercially rated in single and multi-engine planes. As long as you flew the T-6 and the, the T-1. If you um, were a T-37 uh, student and then flew the T-1 or T-38, so you never flew a single engine airplane, then you might not have a single engine privilege on your commercial certificate. You just have multi-engine. So that's the only caveat there. Um, once you're done with that, you can immediately take the ATP CTP class. Those, uh, the class requirements are outlined in uh, 61156 there. Uh, this course costs about $5,000. There's probably around 15 vendors around the country that offer this course. It's one of the new requirements that came around um, as of in 2014 when the rules changed. So uh, in order to take your written, you first have to complete the ATP CTP. Um, so that's a certification training program. It lasts about a week. It involves some ground training, high altitude aerodynamics, stuff that really you already know if you're a graduate of the FTU. Even UPT, you already, it, it'll be a review. Uh, but unfortunately, there's no, there's no way around it for us military folks yet. It'll literally take an act of Congress to get that removed for us. So maybe someday we can either get our... Uh, our annual CRM sim covers all the bases, so if I'm looking at avenues into getting that counted as the CTP course, but until something like that happens or we have a military equivalency done, you're going to have to take that course. So that's your first $5,000 to even start the process. After that, you need to pass the ATP written exam. So there'll, there'll be an exam involved with the ATP CTP class. That's just the end of course exam. That is not the written right so you'll you'll take the end of course exam for your ctp that's something else then you'll go to your testing center and take the actual atp uh, written exam that test result is good for 60 months so you just started a clock by taking that the rest of the test in the fa and including this one used to be 24 months but now the atp is good for 60 months so again you can kind of lead turn this uh, if you're mentoring any of your students on how they should proceed when they get to their squadron, they could really start this whole process. And within 60 months of them passing it, they should be really close to that 750-hour restricted ATP and be able to take, take the practical and, and, you know, get that out of the way early. Uh, I think that would be a better way of doing it. Um, all right, next, complete at least 750 hours of total flight time then you can take the ATP practical, and that's the, the minimum hours you need to take that practical. Um, so you have to have the ATP CTP done, the written done, to finally take your ATP practical. Um, the ATP practical right now, we can't do it in the sim. Uh, I, for, per the FAA, I can do it in the plane, but there's an issue with the maneuvers I have to do on that check ride that the Vol 3 doesn't allow right now in the C-130. So I, unfortunately, I can't do it in the sim or the plane right now. So you're gonna have to go to a third party uh, or a business like mine that has a, a light twin and pay about $3,500 is the average for an ATP practical exam. Uh, there are places that do it a lot cheaper than I can and I just, I can't beat their price. So if you're looking to save money, Downtown Aviation Memphis has a good program. I think it's like 15, 1800 bucks, something like that. Um, so that's, that's the start to finish what it takes to get your ATP. Now, most of y'all probably knew that, but um, it's good review. The actual conduction of the exam, I'm going to go into how I actually conduct an ATP exam. Uh, that's something that maybe if you don't have your ATP, you've never heard a DP go through this. So basically, uh, I'm going to use... Uh, similar to the C-130J Evaluator Guide, it's called the Airman Certification Standards. The, AT, uh, the FAA produces this document and it is the test. It's everything that I have to cover. I can't go, I can't make up my own events. I have to stick to that test. So the ACS is available uh, online. You can just uh, Google ATP ACS and that'll be the search result that pulls up. You can look at this, uh, this hyperlink and it'll take you there. 
Anyway, I, the FAA tells me I have to use a plan of action, so I write a custom plan of action um, for you as the applicant that basically covers here's how we're going to complete everything in the ACS. Uh, we'll do about three different briefings. We do a pre-test briefing, a, uh, a pre-flight briefing, and then a post-flight briefing. So kind of, it, it'll feel similar to a check ride, especially if you do it with me, it'll feel similar to the, a military uh, Form 8 check ride. Um, silence isn't bad. You know, it's kind of different from the Air Force. I can't, I can't really give any good, bad, or ugly while we're doing the check ride. I just have to sit there and let you be a PIC. Uh, you're effectively soloing the airplane. Um, but the FAA says that I, I can't give positive or negative comments. I can't instruct. I just have to be there and conduct the exam as objectively as possible. And then only one opportunity to complete the, uh, the assigned events. And we'll talk about de kind of details of the events that we're going to do during the check ride. Um, but no, no redos on that. So. ATP ground eval, we'll start out with the ground eval. Uh, the FAA calls it the oral. So uh, in the oral, we'll cover uh, the operations of systems for the aircraft you're taking the, the test in. So you're not gonna talk about systems of another airplane or a transport category plane even. If you do it with me, I have a Beechcraft Travel Air. It's a 1959 airplane, it's piston engines, real simple systems. Uh, and you get good instruction prior to that. So you'll know these systems uh, pretty well. Uh, we'll cover the systems, performance, and limitations for the plane that you're flying, uh, weather, high altitude, air carrier operations, human factors, and the code of regulations, uh, or the, the CFR. For the air carrier operations, that'll be very limited. Uh, the ACS speaks specifically to what kind of air carrier operations you need to know, and really that's only if you're doing the ATP check ride in a, in a 121 world environment. So if you think about this test kind of changes depending on what environment you're doing it in. So if you're doing it with a Part 61 guy like me in a piston aircraft, you're gonna stick with Part 61 knowledge, which is, or Part 91 knowledge, which is very, very simple. Kind of think basic ball three stuff. Uh, but you could also pay, you know, $15,000 to go get your type rating in a 737 and do your type rating check ride and your ATP concurrently. In that environment, you'll be expected to know, you know, now you're going to start talking about cabin crew requirements and ETOPS and all the stuff that we're not going to cover if you do it in a smaller airplane. Does that make sense? So this test kind of changes depending on where you're doing it with and, and who you're doing it with. So that's the ground eval. It typically takes about two hours to do the ground eval by the time we get all the administrator done and ask all the questions. It is open book too. Uh, for the flight maneuvers, we're going to start out with just a basic taxi. Uh, we have to do a rejected takeoff. Normally, we do that with a simulated engine failure on the ground. Uh, we won't. We don't do V1 cuts. Uh, we in a in a piston aircraft anyway. It's not ready to do that. So our engine failures in the aircraft have to ha have to happen um, at least below 50% of the computed uh, rotate speed, which is about 84 knots in my plane or 84 miles an hour. Um, so about 40 miles an hour, you'll have some sort of directional control issue and you'll reject the takeoff. So that's your first engine failure. You'll have an engine failure after takeoff that has to happen at or above 400 feet AGL. Uh, that'll be simulated as well. So I'll just pull the throttle back. You'll recover um, appropriately. Then we'll continue to climb up to the working area. We'll do um, a pretty abbreviated uh, area work. We'll do steep turns and usual attitudes, engine shutdown and restart. We'll also do some stall series in there, but basic handling characteristics of the plane uh, in the area. Pretty simple. After that, the kind of the crux of this whole test are the instrument procedures. You have to do four instrument approaches. Uh, you're going to do two precision approaches at least. One of those is going to be single engine. One is going to be without the use of the flight director autopilot. You'll do uh, two non-precision approaches. Uh, one of those will be uh, a circling approach. One will be a partial panel. Uh, one is uh, going to have to have a full course reverse, basically a full procedure off of there. has to be from two different nav aid sources. So we'll do one to a VOR, one to an NDB, or an RNAV, depending on how the aircraft you're flying is equipped. It'll be different nav aid sources for those. And then the mist approach, uh, you got to do two of those, one from a, at least one from precision approach, and then one single engine. Um, and then you have to do holding. Uh, that can be in conjunction with... Uh, one of the approaches that you do, and that's typically how I do my test, 
is we'll do the holding in lieu of uh, RNAV procedure for an approach somewhere. That's how we get that out of the way. Uh, for the possible outcomes, once we're done with the test, you pass. Um, that's good for 120 days. You have a temporary certificate, so that's a good outcome. Um, you could incomplete. That's a, called a discontinuance, and uh, that's good for 60 days. So that just means the plane broke, you broke, I broke, the airport broke, something happened, and we can't fly. And we've already started the test, so that'll discontinue for 60 days. Or you can unsat um, in the Air Force, what we call an unsat. The FAA calls it a disapproval. Uh, disapproval is good for 60 days, so what that means is, unlike in the Air Force, when you unsat on an FAA check ride, I have to tell you when it happens, and then I'll give you the option of either continuing, if we're in the air at that point, uh, I'll give you the option to either continue or stop the check ride. Um, now, if we continue and you do everything else correctly within standards, then all you unsatted for is that one event. So you just need to go back, you get additional training on that one event, come back and do the test again, and you get a, you know, you'll, you'll pass on that, that go if, if you correct the, you know, whatever you unsatted for. Um, so a little bit different than the Air Force, you know, you, you don't really get a vote in the Air Force, the EP just says, yeah, that's Q3, and you gotta do the whole check ride, uh, or depending on what you, what you Q3 for, so. A little, slightly different than the way we do it in the military. Um, I will say that the, the bottom two, the incomplete and unsatisfactory, are very, very, very uncommon. Um, so we have a very high pass rate because we deal with uh, military trained members and we have a good training program. Uh, and, and all the DPEs, whether it's me or the other DPEs in the region, uh, they all understand your military background. And, and they, they sort of get the picture that you're not going to be the best piston aircraft driver they've ever seen. Uh, but you have this, you know, breadth of military experience, and it's it's sort of a, a disservice to you that we're asking you to learn how to fly this small general aviation aircraft just so you can go fly another transport category aircraft with an airline. Doesn't really make sense, but that's that's the rules, and that's that's what you're dealt with. Uh, all right, your meal comp extras. So that's just all about the ATP. Now we can talk about extras, and this is just building kind of your resume fodder, um, if you will. You got your FAA certified flight instructor. You can get that through military competency. So if, as long as you graduated the uh, in instructor school in the Air Force, be it Pitt or uh, instructor school here with a J, uh, you bring in your, uh, or first you go take your military competency instructor exam. That's your MCI. Um, if you click on that link right there, it'll take you to the uh, take you to the actual website of Shepard Air, I believe, that has the study gouge for that test. But highly recommend you know use the study gouge or the test gouge, take the test, then bring me the test results and your form eight, and I'll make you a, a CFI, certified flight instructor. Um, now, a couple things on the certified flight instructor. It's Everybody that is an instructor is a CFI. Uh, there's, there's kind of a colloquialism that says where if you're CFI, that's single engine, and then CFII is instrument, and then MEI is multi-engine instructor. And really, the proper term is it's all a certified flight instructor. It's just what kind of privileges do you have. So if you just instructed in the J, you'll only have multi-engine privileges and instrument privileges. If you went to Pitt, maybe instructed in the T6 or you know, one of the random 208s out in Afghanistan, your instructor, if you had some sort of Air Force single engine aircraft that you have a Form 8 in, then you'll also have single engine, multi-engine, and instrument privileges. But most of the J model guys that just went to instructor school in the J are multi-engine instructors only. So if you want to actually teach somebody in the civilian world in like a Cessna, uh, which I get a lot of older older guys that maybe are already in the airlines and they've got older kids that they're wanting to instruct they'll come to me and I actually have to put them through a training course and then give them a check ride in the aircraft to get their single engine privileges added so there is no avenue for you to add single engine privileges unless you've flown a single engine air force or military aircraft as an instructor Does that makes sense so but you will be a CFI with multi-engine privileges that expires after two years so make sure uh, Every two years, you're bringing in your most current uh, recurrent Form 8 
and that's just an administrative action on my part, a flight instructor renewal. Uh, if you don't want to change your uh, your expiration date, come in within three months of it expiring and we can give you the same expiration date. Just let that roll. Uh, but you never want to let that expire because if you let that expire, you got to come back to me and do a check ride in the plane. You can't just do it on paper. So make sure you're, you've got a Google alert or something that's, that's warning you that you have it coming up and going in there and renew. Uh, I can also add type ratings. So right now on the J, we've got two different type ratings depending on if you did block eight training or not. Uh, L382J and L382J-1 uh, for the block eight. Uh, I can also give your uh, military type ratings in the, in the T1, if you T1 or any other military aircraft that have an equivalent civilian type rating. There's a website on this link uh, available on the on the uh, PowerPoint slide, then it'll take you to that, that table of all the military aircraft that have equivalent uh, civilian type ratings. So as long as you have some sort of documentation that you've flown that aircraft and are rated in it, I'll add that to your um, add that to your certificate. If you went through block eight training uh, and you're just kind of a vanilla UPT, came to the J, you should have about four type ratings. There's two separate ones for the T1 and there's the beach jet and Mitsubishi, uh, and then there's two type ratings now for the J, with the Block Eight and the Block Six. The H model, so, the the H model does too. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good point. This is a J model audience, but yeah, the H model has a separate type rating, so you'd have that one on there as well. Um, what I'm going to do is once a month here at the base, um, I'm going to set up shop somewhere. So just kind of look out, I'll try to spread the word through Facebook and contacts in the squadron and I'll just have walk-in appointments and uh, I'll, I'll just be somewhere with my computer, you, you show up, bring all your required documentation and we'll get your military competencies done uh, without you having to travel to the FISDO. The FISDO will do it, I'll, I'll charge a fee, it'll be a small fee, like 50 bucks. Uh, the FISDO will do it for free but they're booked out pretty far and they're, they'll probably push you to somebody like me. Uh, because they're they're busy with other stuff, so they would rather you use the network of DPEs than than go down to Little Rock. But if you're wanting to save save some money, you can schedule with them, and it'll it'll be a couple months probably for you to get in. Um, so stay tuned for that, and I, you know that's why I'm here today, so you can get my contact info, and if you want to do this, uh, I can help you out. Additional ratings that I can do, uh, helicopter, tailwheel, and seaplane. So this is kind of going beyond of, you know, we were talking earlier about what else is there other than the airlines. Helicopter is an option I offer now. Uh, we've got full helicopter training, so you could you basically do a commercial helicopter add-on. It is very expensive. You're looking about $30,000 to add your commercial. And that's, you know, then you have to go find somewhere to build hours to be insurable at a helicopter. But if it's something you've ever wanted to do, we offer that now. Uh, Tailwheel is a little, little easier, um, a little smaller bite of change there, but for about $700 I can do your Tailwheel endorsement. There, a lot of the airline apps do have a Tailwheel endorsement kind of check off, so $700, bucks, we are good to go. We do uh, backcountry flying in a, uh, in a bush plane, so it's all grass fields, uh, flying down the river, landing on sandbars, it's a lot of fun, so that's a different kind of flying. Uh, seaplane, that is an actual rating, so you can add your single engine seaplane rating. Uh, hands down, the most fun you can have, I think, in a fixed wing aircraft. It is a lot of fun, so we do that out of Searcy, uh, and then we'll we'll hit the local lakes around here, and you basically do splash and goes for about five to six hours with an instructor, and then do a check uh, check ride with a DPE. The uh, the difference between that and the tailwheel, the tailwheel. Is just an endorsement so there's no check ride so you don't you're not really putting skin in the game of exposing yourself to another check ride i know people are worried about that because every time you take a check ride that's a chance to fail a check ride so tailwheel is easy because that's just an endorsement you can't really fail it uh, but the seaplane you you could theoretically fail that but it's it's a lot of fun um, highly recommend it all right your uas certificate this is another one that not everybody thinks about but it's really easy to do uh, if y'all can set up something here, because it's a lot of work for me, uh, y'all can do it internally. Y'all don't need a DPE. 
So if anybody else, I'm sure there's somebody in the squadron that has their CFI already. So all you do is go to the FAA safety team website, you take one course, you print the certificate, you hand it to your instructor, your instructor logs into IACRA and you get the certificate like 60 days later. Um, it is basically completely free if you do it like that. I will charge you if you come to me, um, but again, y'all can do this internally pretty easily. I could train the trainer even if, if you wanted me to show y'all how to do it and y'all could knock it out in a, in a day, get everybody's rating done. It's really easy. Um, yeah, it just shows professional development, you know, education, whatever. It's another certificate to put in your wallet. So that's also an option. Uh, the FAA safety team. This is a great way to show community involvement. I'm heavily involved in the FAA safety team. Um, I do a lot of seminars around the state. Uh, I get a lot of good business from it, honestly, but then I get a lot of fulfillment from it, too, because it's it's the proficiency program for general aviation so making ga safer my livelihood depends on ga being viable and ga's the way it is not viable is if we have a bad safety record and we get regulated to where we're like other countries and ga becomes really hard to do so i hate it when people have accidents and incidents and so this is a direct way you can contribute and use your experience in the military to help our, our general aviation pilots uh, have a have a safer time flying. Um, it's also, again, foot stomp, a great community involvement. The airlines know what this is, and if they see you're involved in the FAA safety team and that you've led safety seminars, and that, that that's good community volunteer work. Uh, if you're interested in that, contact me. I'm the lead representative for the base. Um, so we've got several seminar opportunities if you want to help that are coming up in the next uh, three months. So my next one is Saturday, and then I've got another one on the 20th at Conway. So this is part of our mid-air collision avoidance program as well on the base. So it's a good way to get involved. Um, and then if you have any questions, we can, we can talk real quick. Here's my info. Write down my phone number, email. Look me up on the social meds.